Uh, hello, good morning. Welcome to uh, this lecture uh, for ECU 101, that is Physics for Engineers 1. And um, the first lecture basically is to introduce the unit and to just let you know uh, who is going to teach it. That is myself, Dr. Edgar Witte. I'm a lecturer from the Physical Sciences Department. That is a school of pure and applied sciences. So welcome all to First Machakos University and welcome to this lecture. This is called Physics for Engineers. I know you are engineering students, but this is a unit offered by the Department of Physical Sciences because the physics component is uh, very important in engineering. So I'll just start straight away. The first topic uh, that we shall discuss is the properties of matter, as you can see on the screen there. Uh, but remember, the course outline I've already shared with you in the LMS system. So you can have the course outline so that you'll be able to follow what lecture, uh, I mean, what is the what content is being, is being covered in, in each lecture every week. So, um, my screen so this is what we shall be discussing today i have put it uh, in, in two main parts first we shall do an introduction to physics for engineers uh, the, that is basically the connection between physics and engineering so under that one we shall look at physics and engineering as a sub area then we shall look at what we call nature and laws of physics as another sub area. Then straight after that, we shall look at uh, the first topic in the course content, that is the properties of matter. So these properties of matter should be, I mean, is going to be our first um, main topic. And then others will follow um, based on what is there in the course content. So first and foremost, somebody should be asking himself or herself, uh, physics for engineers. What is the relation between physics and engineering? Now, as an engineer, whether you are a mechanical engineer, you are an ele electrical engineer, or you are a civil engineer, you are basically required to know how to build things okay you can construct something from different parts that means you put them together and as, at the same time you should be able to dismantle or separate different parts of a section okay that is basically what an engineer is required to do if you are constructing a bridge then of course you are supposed to take uh, uh, metal bars um, gutters um, concrete and things like that then you assemble them and you put them together, okay? That is what an engineer does. Now, you will find out that engineering cannot stand on its own, okay? Engineering, it, it, you cannot just start in engineering from scratch to the end without bringing in the idea of physics, the idea of mathematics. Those small components are very vital they are actually the fund the, the foundations or the fundamental bit of engineering as we shall see as we go along so what is what about physics we have seen that engineers assemble things and dismantle things but what about physics now the word physics has very close relation to the physical nature all right so physics tries to figure out what laws um, in the physical world uh, will help make predictions, all right? You have uh, encountered things like the Newton's laws of motion. The Newton's laws of motion, what do they do? They try to predict how a motion of a body will be under certain conditions. Okay, the conditions could be uh, on, on whether when the road whether the road is smooth 
what will the speed of the car be after maybe five seconds if the road is rough what will be the speed how much friction is required to stop the vehicle so that is those are there are laws that are trying to predict the physical world okay so physics brings in the fundamental laws engineers after they have been guided by the laws they can now decide to take a particular weight of a if it is a, a steel beam they can know how much weight to put in a bridge um, uh, to, to support maybe a number of vehicles or something like that but basically physics builds in the foundation by introducing the laws that will predict uh, nature so it tries to boil the universe down into some basic mathematical laws engineering on the other hand is concerned with figuring out how to design build and use structures and machines all right so i think you sh from there you should be able to see some difference physics brings in the laws okay i've mentioned newton's laws there are su there's something called hooke's law there's something called stress strain young's modulus uh, if it is electricity you have ohm's law you have the Kirchhoff laws uh, and many other laws in in in, um, in in electrical. If it is mechanical, you have now the Newton's laws is mechanical. You have the Hooke's law that is mechanical, uh, and, uh, and and many others that probably you may not be aware of at this point. But as you proceed, you should be able to know. So physics brings in laws. Engineering tries to figure out how to design and build. Uh, structures and machines okay so let's look at this example let's say you are building a complex suspension suspension bridge that is for civil engineers you you are required to build a bridge that is very strong a bridge that can take the weight of thousands of vehicles so if you are not guided by any law it will be difficult for you to design a bridge that will take care of the weight of the cars and maybe the strength of the wind. Yeah, because if you build it without considering that, then wind will just come and wash the bridge away. Okay. Now, also, the bridge has to be able to handle very strong wind. We have said that when there is rain, the bridge should be able to handle that and anything else that nature might offer so it's not just about putting structures together there are other considerations that somebody has to put in place those considerations are now the forces of nature and physics tries to predict what nature looks like or what nature will, will behave how nature will behave so we're saying if the engineer gets it wrong, if you don't put in the right weight of the bars, you don't put structure it considering all those things we have mentioned, one unusually strong side effect might occur and the whole structure will collapse. Okay, that's very obvious. The way to make sure the things you are building will work properly is to analyze using the laws of physics an engineer you must remember that even when you see um, engineers constructing roads where you live or maybe you if you have seen tractors building roads it's not just putting concrete and stones together there is calculation that is done already to make sure that if uh, um, whatever weight of vehicle passes that road it should be able to handle and if it is not able to handle say maybe uh, 10 tons of a tractor then such a road will have um, there will be a sign that this road is not good for vehicles that have weight beyond this so how how they tell 
the uh, well, I mean, what kind of vehicle should pass there is based on some calculations. And those calculations come from the laws of physics. Okay. So now you should be able to be seeing, you should, be, you should start seeing how physics is related to engineering. The laws of physics are used to predict what engineers should be able to do. Okay. So the laws of physics can tell you about the forces, the tension, the vibrations, oscillations, the strength, the elasticity, and all kinds of other concepts that you may use to predict calculations about your bridge. I've already mentioned that. So simply put, if you understand the laws of nature, then you can use that knowledge to predict what will happen to the things you are building. Engineering involves applying physics in technical ways, applying it to technology. I think that is very clear. So I have uh, put for you a question here that I want to challenge you to also try to answer it. The question is, identify two areas or examples in your engineering field where physics and engineering are interrelated. In each case, explain how the two are related. So what I'm saying here, if you are doing electrical engineering, identify two areas where physics and engineering are interrelated, where one requires the other. If you are in mechanical engineering, or if you are doing mechanical engineering, you need to do the same. Uh, identify areas where engineering and physics are interrelated. If you are in civil engineering, I've already mentioned about the suspension bridge, but there are several others. I need you to identify two and explain how the two are related. I think that is a very small activity that you can do and then share. let's share it in, in class. So our first topic begins here. That is the properties of materials. This, this particular topic is important because different materials have uh, different applications. Okay. If you want to build a hammer, you need to select a specific type of metal. If you want to build uh, maybe the tire of a vehicle, uh, you need to select a certain type of material. I mean, basically, everything that you can think of is a material. And different materials have different applications. So this topic is very important because we shall be able to define all the properties of materials and where they are basically needed. So the properties of materials are a way of describing what a material is capable of and how it will behave under certain conditions. This is important when choosing materials for certain jobs. For instance, choosing building materials or finding a good electrical insulator or handle of an electrician's screwdriver. So that is just an introduction. Now, density is one of the basic properties because different materials have different densities. We all know water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meters. Milk has a different uh, density, 800, I think, kilograms per cubic meters. If you go to solids, wood has a different density. Different metals have different densities and so on. So density is... Uh, one of the main properties that defines a material, okay? So the density of a material tells you how much mass you find in each cubic meter, okay? If you remember, the, the SI unit of density is kilogram per cubic meters. That means uh, for every cubic meter, how much weight do you find there? If it is a piece of uh, a piece of uh, solid, if you if you take a volume of one cubic meter and get the mass of that volume, then that be, that mass becomes the density. That's why we call it. Uh, I mean, uh, mass per unit volume. 
So mass divided by the volume. It depends upon the mass of particles which make up the, the material and how closely they are arranged. For instance, most substances become more dense when they freeze as the arrangement of particles become more ordered and therefore closer together. So again, here we are just emphasizing what uh, the definition of density is. For example, you don't expect the density of air to be the same as the density of water. The reason is very simple. If you look at air, which is also a material, the distance between the particles is very big compared to the particles in water. So if you take one cubic meter of air and you measure that weight, it will be much smaller compared to, you take again one cubic meter of water and you measure the weight. So you find weight will have a, a lot of particles in one cubic uh, meter. Air will have little particles in one cubic meter. So that's another way of how to look at density. But we are saying, even though we are saying that when, when, when substances freeze, when they become solid, when they change from liquid to solid, then the particles become very close and the density increase. But water is uh, one, one material that, is, that has a slightly different um, trend when it comes to the density. You have learned something called the anomalous expansion of water. That is the abnormal behavior of water. Water has the maximum density at around 4 degrees. So beyond 4 degrees, when you heat water, it expands just like any other substance. But from 4 degrees coming down, if you freeze water from 4 degrees backwards, you don't expect the particles to come closer together. Instead, the particles become more spaced. That means the density um, the density decreases, okay, because it becomes more space, while the volume increases. So water is just one one material that has um, that has a different trend in terms of uh, behavior of density. But well, let's look at others. So basically, uh, density is uh, mass per unit volume and is measured in kilogram per cubic meter. Liquids and gases. Can also you can also get the density by same formula, that is mass per unit volume. Although we know that liquids can cannot be compressed, and so they occupy a fixed volume. But as they flow, they do not maintain a fixed shape. Yeah, if you put water in a one container, it takes the shape of that container. If you change the container, the shape of uh, the water changes. So they do not have a fixed shape. So this means that density of a liquid does not change regardless of what shape it takes. So the shape and density are not related. Gases expand to fill whatever container they are put in. As such, they have no fixed shape and their volume also depends on the volume of the container. Therefore, the density is also fixed and it depends upon the volume of the container. I think that is uh, form one physics. Now, the first property, the second property that we need to, to know is something called deformation. To deform, to deform basically means to, to change the form or to change the shape. So how do you change the shape? If you squeeze something like an ugali when you want to eat it, you basically uh, put some force on all directions. So when you do that, you are actually deforming it. If you take a rubber band and you try to pull it on both uh, two sides, the shape changes. It becomes thinner and longer. So that is deformation. So when a force is applied to a material, we say that stress has been applied to it. This can result in a change in shape, which we call deformation. How a material acts under stress depends upon its properties. Yeah. Deforming materials results in a change in shape. So I think that is okay. 
as far as that explanation is concerned because when you apply force we say that you are you are putting stress yeah now i don't know whether you did this in high school but stress is defined as force per unit area don't forget pressure is also defined as force per unit area the difference between stress and uh, and pressure is that stress is deforming force per unit area a deforming force can be tension that means you are stretching both sides it can be compression that means you are compressing both sides so that is a deforming force anytime you are, you want to deform something we say you apply stress now pressure is force per unit area but the force is perpendicular force we actually say that force is i mean pressure is a perpendicular force per unit area so that is the definition of deformation applying stress in order to change the shape and we are saying that uh, for example if you have uh, say ugali the force you apply to squeeze ugali might not be the same as the force you apply to squeeze sand because they are two different materials so you might find in some materials you apply a lot of stress to change the shape in others you apply just little stress to change shape so again different materials will take different stress to change their shape now uh, when materials are stretched initially they will return to the original shape as long as stress applied to a material remains within elastic limit it will always return to its original shape so the first point here i want to explain what we call elastic limits a good example to help you understand this elastic limit is a rubber band when you pull both sides of a rubber band and you let it go the rubber band returns back to original shape okay when you pull further when you apply more stress or you 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 extend the 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 force the amount of force applied there is a point that is reached that when you when you when you release the when you remove the force the rubber band does not go back to original shape if that happens it means you have gone beyond the limit for expansion which which we are calling elastic limit so elastic limit is simply defined as a point beyond which a material um, does not return to its original shape when it when it is stretched elastic bands are of course the best example of elastic materials they can be stretched a great deal without being permanently deformed we call this elastic deformation so when a material you can pull it apart and then it trans we say that is elasticity or elastic deformation but when you stretch it and it doesn't go back to the original size that becomes now plastic deformation so plastic is when you permanently change the shape we call that plastic deformation so there is elastic deformation and there is plastic deformation then there are two terms here ductile, ductile and malleable materials fine if these are new terms to you then we should be able to define what they are ductility means the ability to be able to stretch materials into thin wires if you if you have a big volume of say copper now if you put some force into the copper that means you deform it so that it, you turn the volume into some thin wires then we say that material is ductile there are materials that you cannot do that if you try to make them thin they break easily so the material materials that behave that way are not ductile malleability now you have seen what we call the iron sheets for roofing our houses 
before an ion becomes into a thin sheet, it was once a big lump of iron, just like a stone, a big one. But then, if a deforming force is applied on that iron to make it flat, if it becomes flat without breaking, then we say that that material is malleable. So malleability is the ability to deform material to become uh, thin sheets. Okay? If you can turn a material into a thin sheet, then it is malleable. If you can turn a material into a thin rod, then that is ductility. So the difference between these two is that uh, sometimes you might want to change, say, copper. Copper is a good ductile material. That's why we use it for making electrical wires. Electrical wires are thin and long, and they are made of copper, and some of them aluminium. If you try using other materials, it, they might not become very thin, or you might not be able to even bend them, so they will break. If they break, if they don't deform into thin sheets, then we call that brittleness, okay? Just like biscuit. You try to bend biscuit, it breaks without bending. That is brittleness. So ductility is for making thin rods. Malleability is for making thin sheets. Elasticity in other materials relies on the bonds between the molecules behaving a little like springs. But some materials are often not very elastic and will soon snap as the bond break. So that is elasticity. Now, stiffness, this is not a new term. Stiffness is the resistance a material offers to being bent, whether elastically or plastically. So, simply put, if you try to bend, the keyword here is bend. If you try to bend a material and it breaks, we say that material is not stiff. If you are able to apply a lot of force for you to bend the material, then we, we say that that material is very stiff. So the idea here is, if you want to deform a material by bending, then the amount of force you apply to make it bend or to break will define whether the material is stiff or not stiff. A steel sheet can be plastically or permanently bent, a wooden sheet or a wooden rod can be elastically bent. Both require considerable force and both are stiff. So again, there's a comparison between steel and wood. We are saying steel, if you want to bend steel, yes, you can bend steel. But the amount of force you need to bend steel is not the same amount of force you need to bend what? Wood. So... The two materials are stiff, but one is more stiffer than the other. Here, I think steel, when you, you need a lot of force for you to bend steel, but you need just a little force to bend uh, wood, so steel becomes stiffer. We have defined ductility already. A ductile material is one which is relatively easy to stretch beyond elastic limit. This is plastic deformation, which means that once stretched, the material will remain in that shape. If you take some blue tack, okay, I'm sure you know something called blue tack. It's very common in the lab, especially the chemistry labs, and carefully stretch it. It gets longer and thinner without breaking and retains its shape when the load is removed. Okay, so the ability to stretch a material to make it into thin rod gives, I mean, defines the ductility. Copper is a good example of a ductile material. Its ductility is one reason why it is used in, is used to wiring as it can be stretched into long, thin wires without breaking. Okay? I think that is emphasized enough. Oh, so for this first lecture, I think we have only defined those few materials, those few properties of materials. In lecture number two, we shall continue to define more properties and uh, maybe uh, highlight more examples 
where each property is, uh, is, is needed. So for this particular lecture, I think that is the end. Uh, I would want you to simply uh, listen to this lecture uh, again and again, and probably you can also uh, download these notes so that you have them as uh, part of your uh, archive because the exam will cover everything from day one up to the time when you shall be doing your examination. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Be ready for lecture number two very soon. Thank you very much.